So the most, most effective way to overcome latch up is to isolate transistors from each other. When we first talked about MOSFETs, we said that they are self-isolating devices. They create depletion regions around themselves, helping to isolate each transistor from the next. However, this is not good enough in terms of uh, isolation because we need to isolate the transistors, not just to prevent interaction between them, but also to prevent the formation of parasitic bipolar structures between NMOS and PMOS transistors. If we have to use both types of transistors, which we have to do in all CMOS families, then we have to introduce some other measure of isolation. In the low-cost fabrication flow, the method of isolation is by using field oxide or thick oxide to separate transistors from each other. Now, field oxide is going to be effective at separating transistors from each other when it is grown to a very high thickness. But there is a problem when we start to uh, form field oxide. Remember that we are using silicon, di uh, silicon nitride to uh, protect the areas that will have thin oxide from oxidation. And so the more we try to oxidize the substrate and the thicker the substrate gets, the more it starts to um, uh, oxidize below the nitride, causing it to lift. This will cause the formation of something called the burr's beak pattern in which uh, there's like a structure similar to a burr's beak that is extending under the nitride and causing it to be lifted. This will eat up from the real estate of the area uh, that should be covered in thin oxide and uh, will thus reduce the channel length, the minimum channel length that we can fabricate because we have now to have tolerance for the uh, segments that will be lifted by the burst beak pattern. If we don't allow the field oxide to grow thick enough, it will not provide good enough isolation for transistors from each other. Which is why practical CMOS technologies use something called trench isolation. Trench isolation could either be shallow trench isolation or deep trench isolation. Um, it all depends on the depth of the trench that we create. Uh, what happens here is that we use uh, photoresist and photolithography to create a pattern and then we use etchants, first etchants that eat away at uh, silicon dioxide to eat away the silicon dioxide that existed here and then an etchant that can eat through the silicon substrate to dig into the silicon substrate and create a trench. Depending on the depth of the trench we create, which is of course going to be a function of the length of time we allow for etching, we would be doing either shallow trench isolation or deep trench isolation. Remember, one of the challenges of using wet etching is that it will uh, create lateral etching, and so this will also eat up inside. And so that's a challenge in the fabrication of trench isolation. In any case, once we have created the trenches by, uh, by removing these areas, we use, first of all, we remove the remaining uh, photoresist, and then we use chemical vapor deposition to deposit a uh, thick layer of silicon dioxide. This thick layer of silicon dioxide is going to deposit on the trenches, filling them. It's also going to deposit on the surface of the substrate, creating additional silicon dioxide. So you can expect some irregularity on the surface of the wafer after you do this. However, by using CMP, you can polish the wafer back to a very, uh, to a very uh, fine uh, surface, provided, of course, that you have made uh, your calculations correctly and you have overfilled the trenches. So you have to deposit enough silicon dioxide to overfill the trenches. Uh, once we have done this, we end up with uh, trenches that can isolate transistors from each other. And so a transistor that is created uh, in this area is going to be completely isolated from a transistor that is created in this area. Uh, in other words, uh, when they try to form bipolar structures with each other, they're going to have to do it deep in the substrate, which is not going to be easy. And it's going to create bipolar transistors with very low current gain, which allows them to uh, break down the positive feedback that causes latch up. So this is a very effective way to combat latch up. One other topic I want to discuss here is how copper wires are patterned. When we looked at the low-cost design flow, uh, we were using aluminum to form wire wires, 
and aluminum has a, a good property which is that it can be dry etched so what we did uh, back then was we first opened uh, the vias or the contacts and then we deposited a, a very thick layer of, um, of metal uh, and the metal in that case was aluminum uh, we then used uh, photoresist on top of the metal to cover the areas that where we want where we actually want metals to exist and then we used uh, dry etching uh, to etch away the areas that we did not want and the photoresist would protect the areas where we wanted to have uh, metal wires and that way we formed the metal wires that we wanted the problem with aluminum despite its good uh, uh, you know technical properties in terms of etching is that it has a relatively high uh, uh, resistivity and so when we talk about wire resistance we will find that it is uh, extremely destructive because wire resistance causes wire delay to increase substantially as we shrink down chips when we shrink down chips the contribution of wire delay to total delay increases relatively and resistance is a main factor in this so when we look at other metals to use as wires the options we have are gold silver and copper and while gold and silver have interesting properties copper has a higher conductivity and so it is usually the element of choice now uh, copper has a few problems for example uh, it is very reactive with air usually forming a layer of copper oxide or patina on top but fortunately when used in microchips the interconnects are buried in a layer of silicon dioxide and cannot interact with the outside air so it's perfectly suitable for for microchips one other problem with copper is that there aren't really any good etchants you cannot etch it with uh with plasma so it cannot be dry etched and uh, the properties that we get with uh, wet etching of uh, metal wires are very undesirable so it's not easy to etch copper and so instead of etching copper we use uh, something called the Damascene process to uh, pattern uh, copper wires and in fact it's a it's a process very similar to that used for uh, for trench isolation which is why I included it in the same video and it's very dependent on uh, chemical mechanical polishing as we will see so we begin with a chip uh, in which there's a layer of silicon dioxide and it's, it has to be perfectly uh, flat so we have to use cmp to flatten it first then we apply a photoresist and expose it and develop it the areas that are exposed from the photoresist uh, that will be de developed away are the areas where we actually want the uh, copper wires so uh, we will have transparency where we want the wires this is as opposed to the uh, aluminum uh, metal one mask for example then we will use etching to etch away silicon dioxide so even though we cannot etch copper we can etch silicon dioxide so we will etch away silicon dioxide and the depth of etching into the oxide will be the depth of the wires that we create so it's important to control the depth precisely because this will control the cross-section of the wire and thus the resistance of the wire then we use pvd to deposit copper on top of the wafer we have to uh, cover it in a very thick layer of copper so that we overflow the trenches that we create so we have to overfill and overfill comfortably otherwise we might create unwanted opens or shorts then we use cmp and CMP will polish down the wafer until we reach the surface of silicon dioxide. CMP can actually do this and it can stop at a certain material. In this case, we will stop at the surface of glass or silicon dioxide. Um, this leaves the metal wires that we uh, created only in the trenches and thus gives us the traces that we want. Notice that this process is contingent on a very flat surface. To begin with and a very flat surface at the end because what we will do next is that we will deposit silicon dioxide on top and then move on to a uh, metal two layer there's also something called the double damascene process so this is called the damascene process there's something called the double damascene process in which we also create copper wires using the very same manner but the only difference is 
that before we overfill, we will actually also open up uh, openings for contacts or wires. And so when we PVD or deposit the metal, it will fill the contacts and the wires of the layer that we are working with, as well as the layer itself. So it just saves a step of fabrication along the way.